Hello and welcome back to another episode of Breaking Monero. Today we are talking about public mining pool data. Public mining pools allow people to mine uh, with the help of other people that share a block reward, but in doing so they often reveal a lot of information about the blocks that they mine and the transactions that they make. Now, this transparency is good for miners. Miners want to know when pools find blocks and when they send out their payments, of course. They want to check to make sure the pool isn't trying to rip them off in some sort of fashion. But this is actually generally bad for the rest of the network's perspective because the pool is giving a high level of visibility to the outputs that it handles, which ultimately could impact the privacy of other members on the network. Individuals can use the information from the blocks that they mine and the transactions that they send in order to compile a list of outputs that the pool controls. And just like any other large, uh, out, large output list that someone published, it could cause some damage. And for the in the case of large public pools, this actually starts to become a large enough proportion of the total Monero outputs that we start to need to pay attention. So um, we're back on today. I'm Justin, we have Serang again. Serang, can you talk a little bit more about what the public pools make public and why this is important? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends on what the pool is doing. So of course, um, when any miner, whether they are you know part of a pool or whether they're mining solo, it doesn't matter, the network doesn't really care. Um, the block contains a special uh, transaction called the Coinbase transaction, which generates basically the reward um, for the miner, or it could be you know, the operator of the mining pool, whoever's collecting for that group. Um, it includes an output um, that is specially designated and specially identifiable as being essentially for the reward for the miner. So typically call that a Coinbase output. Um, if you are a solo miner, if I'm just kind of mining on my own computer and I get one of those, I think, hooray, I get to keep it. And then later I can spend that in a transaction, do whatever the heck I want with it. So there aren't a whole lot of issues with that. So if you're a solo miner and you're just kind of spending stuff as normal, your know, life's pretty good. Um, but if you're part of a mining pool, you know the block reward goes to one address because that's the way the network is set up. And then that pool, the operator, whoever's running it, um, will then need to essentially pay out shares, like you were saying, um, of the mining reward to the participating miners according to whatever type of algorithm they use to determine that. And that typically looks like a payout transaction. So a payout transaction will you know, often look like, you know, one, maybe you know, a couple more inputs um, going into the transaction to be spent, and then a whole bunch of outputs going off to destinations that the network can't identify, of course. These are one-time addresses, but that we might be able to infer are destined for you know, the, uh, the individual miners who are participating in the pool. So we, we occasionally see these types of transactions, which have maybe one or two inputs and a whole bunch of outputs, then we can probably identify that those, ah, those might be minor payouts. Again, most transactions, if I'm just sending, you know, to make a purchase or something, may have a few different inputs, but typically, you know, two outputs. You know, the destination for whatever I'm actually, you know, spending the money on, an exchange output, which you know, will be directed back to me. So these definitely stand out on the network. And the way that Monero's transaction protocol is set up, while ideally, again, we can't tell which inputs are being spent and where the outputs are destined for, we can identify how many of them there are. I can definitely see in the transaction how many inputs are being spent and how many outputs are being generated. Um, and of course, a mining pool, like you were saying, in the interest of transparency, might also publish lists identifying which Coinbase outputs are generated for rewards for that pool and which, um, which transactions contain payouts. So there's data that is either on the chain already and you know, a clever or even not so clever adversary might try to you know, glean, glean some information from, and the pools themselves might publish some or all of that information for transparency on their end too. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. So to go over some of the goals that we have uh, sort of from a Monero network perspective. So number one, we want to make sure that Monero's ring size can account for these, these known outputs or the, these heuristically dead outputs. So that involves doing analysis to make to, to see what the ultimate impact is, what proportion of the outweighted outputs these are, and making sure that the ring size can meet these requirements because even if we go through a list of other mitigations, there, there can always be bad actors. Maybe a, we might come up with a list of best uh, best case, uh, a list of requirements for pools to follow and they might just ignore them and purposely do malicious behavior or any other actor could try and do malicious behavior. So we need to make sure that Manoa's ring size meets these requirements. Also, we wanna keep the requirements on pools light 
um, and maintain transparency as possible. We know that from a miner's perspective, they want to know when, when blocks are being mined in order to keep the pools accountable. So the ideal solution, of course, would be so that pools could still share as much information as possible. Um, also, keeping the impact to the network light as possible. We could recommend that everyone churns all the time, but that's not necessarily good for, for network's health if we're always recommending that every time a pool finds a block, they create six transactions. Like that's not necessarily something that's good for, for everyone overall. Um, and then we also want to avoid wallet interaction. If wallets need to be scraping API data and other sort of information, it gets burdensome from the user and it's prone to being fed incorrect or malicious information. We want to, um, and ultimately the, the main goal is to preserve the integrity of the output. So pools can send transactions, they can, they can publish information, but we want to make it so that in doing so, we don't, block, we don't um, mark the outputs that they control as known spent during these time periods. Ideally, we, we want to make it so that if these outputs are included in other ring signatures, that we can't, as an outside observer, immediately exclude these as known bad. And I think it's and also worth noting too that, you know, with all this introduction stuff, you know, it makes it sound like, my goodness, you know, are, are public pools good for the network? If there's all these things that, you know, we can identify and go wrong. And I would say absolutely not. I mean, you know, a lot of people do not mine on their own. Um, because depending on the computational resources you have, you know, you'll have a lot of variability in when you're going to get payouts. And, you know, that's not maybe great for the individual miner. So public pools do offer kind of a, they kind of reduce the variability for individual miners. And in some sense can encourage people to mine who would otherwise not have mined. So there's definitely a benefit to getting more miners on the network in this kind of organized way. But we do have to be careful that, you know, we're, whatever behavior we're choosing, it's, we make sure that it's, we make sure that it's easy to do the right thing and that you know pools that don't do the right thing just for economic or incentive based reasons you know aren't harming the network thanks Frank. so i am sh currently sharing my screen regarding some of the public mining pool data i'm going over my defcon slides just so you can see them in a little bit more detail let me pull up the laser pointer here again so we can divide the pool outputs into two main categories. We have the Coinbase outputs. These are new outputs that they mine out of blocks. And then they have what I'm calling payment outputs. So these are outputs that individuals send in transactions. And so we have to account for them differently. There's a number of strategies that we can use to approach this information. I've listed them under their respective category. There isn't really a great option for these Coinbase outputs. We can say, pools should not publish a list, but of course that has its own set of downsides. We could say that they should churn secretly, but that has its own bloat downsides. Ultimately users can go to option, like their, their main options are to mark the Coinbase outputs so they interact with the pool API, ask the pool, hey, what blocks have you mined? And then they do not use those outputs or they could just avoid the Coinbase outputs. There's certainly some debate within the research community in Monero about what the best process is there. We're not gonna to focus too much on these Coinbase outputs, but it's something that you should be, you should be aware of as an individual. Um, regarding the payments, this is something where pools have an option to make much less impact on the rest of the network, and I'm gonna walk through how they can do this. So of course they could again, not publish, but miners want to have this information published. Uh, you could also mark payment outputs. So pools might just publish a list of all the outputs they control and people would need to not use those. But of course that requires interaction and it, it has a high potential for pools to feed malicious information to users. So I, we have this other solution called the modified input selection algorithm that I'm going to walk you through. And what this simply does is adjust the outputs that pools use to send transactions in a way that it, it definitely protects the integrity of the outputs that they're receiving from these, these payment outputs as, as I'm calling them. So let's look at these really quick. So let's say that a pool makes a payout transaction. In this case, they're only sending funds to, to, to two users and one output this this lighter one that is going back to themselves. So this is a change output that is going back to the pool. Now the concern is that, okay, these two, well, these two individuals receive their payout, but let's say a pool creates another transaction here where the only output that they control 
um, is obviously spent here. So by that, I mean these other block outputs here could are outputs that the pool does not control, and so you know that they're not spent. Since you have a list of all of the outputs that the pool controls, you know that this is the actual output that was spent by the pool. Um, so as a result, you can mark all these other decoys as fake for this transaction. You, you know that they are decoys. And then you can say, okay, well, I know now that this transaction or this output is spent in this specific transaction. So as a result, if this output appears in any other transactions, I know it is fake. Um, and that could have a potential impact on the network if there are enough of those cases. Um, however, instead, if the pool determine, uh, decides to select outputs in its ring from the transactions that it sends to the users, so it makes a payout to these users, and it, of course, has this change output again, so it uses all three of these in a ring signature, sure, you can still mark the black ones here as decoys because there's no way for the pool to have actually spent those. But it theoretically could have spent any of these because you don't know which of the outputs in this transaction were the change output. So as a result, the change output here now looks the same as any other legitimate mining payout. And as a result, we preserve the integrity of this output. This output no longer needs to be marked by wallet clients. And you can see that if we compare that to any other minor transaction where a miner here just sends funds that they receive as a payout, that would look the same as a transaction that would just use this minor payout or the change output as a decoy. So just really walking through how the integrity of the output is preserved there. So that's some really basic information covering how public mining pool data, especially in regards to the payouts, can go through a sort of novel solution where there's no additional harm to the network. We can The pools can still publish all the information that's needed. They can just make a really small tweak in order to preserve the integrity of the payout outputs that they make. So I think I thought that was pretty interesting when I when I had this revelation for these outputs. Um, so Saran, can you talk a little bit uh, a little bit more in depth about some of the analysis uh, about how these outputs impact people? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the a lot of the different kinds of analysis that we've been talking about in previous episodes, and you know, maybe talking about in future episodes, um, are about the idea of whether or not it's known or suspected that a given output is spent or unspent. So obviously, in assets like Bitcoin, you can you can identify unspent transaction outputs and spent transaction outputs. We know that that's you know built into basically the way the transaction protocol works. But in Monero, of course, ideally, we don't want to know if transaction outputs are unspent or spent because then we can identify them as decoys or not decoys in particular transactions. So as Justin was mentioning, under certain circumstances, you may be able to remove kind of heuristically in your head as you're analyzing different transactions, you may be able to, able to kind of internally flag or remove certain ring members as decoys or just flat up see if you can guess which one might be a true spend. Of course, these are heuristics and absent other information, there's no way to tell for sure. But this, you know, basically kind of exacerbates that, right? So if, you know, if we're dealing with, for example, a chain split, which is something we've talked about before, which, you know, if done improperly, um, you know, can allow folks to kind of flag outputs as being decoys or not. Or if there were to be, for example, a chain reaction caused by something else, then we know that that can also allow people to kind of flag certain outputs as decoys or not. So, you know, this kind of fits into this whole broad idea that we've kind of been hinting at and talking about throughout the whole series, which is that anything that allows us to identify or statistically guess if something is a decoy or not is not good. And it can kind of fit in with these other forms of analysis too. So our goal is to make everything look uniformly the same. Um, and of course, this can be very tough to do. Um, a lot of times, you know, it, it causes us to put a lot of other burdens and requirements on the chain. So for example, we could require that, you know, all transactions have a certain fixed number of outputs, even if they don't need them. But you know that can cause a lot of bloat and work too. So it's you know it's it's a contentious thing to do, right? And of course, it is worth noting too um, that unlike some of the other types of analysis where you can look at an output and provably for sure know that it's spent or not, you know, using set theory or other kinds of graph analysis, the stuff that you've been talking about, Justin, are typically the idea of something that might be heuristically identifiable, which means that it's a guess, a statistical guess based on certain things you suspect about transaction patterns or behavior. So 
you know, again, absent other information, nothing could be proven about that, but it could allow the adversary to make a pretty good guess. So Strang, what are the key takeaways for people who are watching this episode? Do, do people need to be concerned about these? And if so, what can they really do to protect themselves? Um, so, so in general, like you were saying, the idea of you know having a ring size that has gotten larger over time is kind of a layered approach, right? So increasing ring size is one thing that can be done to mitigate, but certainly not eliminate, you know, certain forms of analysis that we've been talking about, including this one. You know, so the idea is that if for whatever reason, you know, you choose your ring member decoys poorly and they happen to be caught up in something involving a public pool or a you know a, a chain split or something, you know, even if an adversary could kind of flag that as being, ah, well, I bet that's a decoy. If your ring size is large enough and, you know, the effects of these analyses aren't large enough, you know, you still have the benefit of all the other decoys in your ring. So in general, you know, increasing ring size over time, which is something that we do, you know, other projects have different philosophies on the same ideas, um, is something that can be done to mitigate. And of course, we have um, a, a spent output tool, formerly called the black ball tool, but, you know, I don't really like that word. But there is a tool that, you know, you can run. You can either download lists of spent outputs at your own risk or run it yourself to um, to basically make sure that your wallet avoids selecting outputs that are either provably dead or that are kind of heuristically dead if you're able to you know pull in other information about things like public pool outputs you know is this necessary for most people you know i would argue probably not if it's something that you're really concerned about based on your own personal risk model it's something you could certainly consider and there's resources um, there's resources elsewhere on how to run that how to do it and how to use it safely um, but it is also worth noting too that you know, this, this is a particularly tricky one. So this kind of falls into the, the specific question of what do we do with Coinbase outputs and with things that we suspect relate to pools? You know, there's some proposals that say, you know, maybe we only, you know, deal with Coinbase outputs and rings in certain ways. Or when we're picking decoys, maybe we, you know, avoid Coinbase outputs or, you know, use them only in particular patterns. And these are tricky because they all come with different trade-offs and different consequences. And it's definitely an area of very, very ongoing research on you know, how we handle Coinbase outputs, both with kind of default wallet behavior or at kind of a more network-wide required level. And, you know, we, we, don't really have, we don't really have a solution right now that I think everyone is completely happy with, but it's something that we're really, really actively working on right now. And then I have one final note too, is that um, the public mining pool data over time is a reliable source of information that attackers or observers can use in conjunction with other information they're trying to find. So if an attacker is able is trying to do a chain split attack, and let's say they only get like 50% of the outputs over a certain time period to be observable from this chain split attack, but 20% of the outputs over that time period were observable as, as a result of the pool, well, we can't test the, we sh or at least shouldn't test these individually a smart observer would be looking at the 50% and then the extra 20% to do a, a test of about 70% of the output. So uh, the reason that this pool information is so important is that it's a recurring sort of information that could help contribute to other forms of attack and make them more powerful because it's a constant reliable source of information that people can use. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, um, you know the, the the various chain splits that we might tend to worry about, you know, there's only very, very few of them that we've seen so far. But you're right, you know, mining pools operate all the time. Coinbase outputs are generated very reliably. And as a result, mining payouts also happen fairly reliably. So you might not have to worry too much about chain splits. And, you know, for the most part, we tend not to. Um, but you're right. There's, there's a lot of data that will continue coming in with public pool outputs. So working very hard to make sure that um, that folks can continue to use the network safely without having to worry about these things. All right, thanks. Any final comments, Sarang? Active area of research. <laughs> as, with, as, as, with, as with a lot of other forms of analysis, you know, it's something that's very tricky. You know, it's something we are aware of and do acknowledge that it is a limitation of the way that Monero is structured. You know, it's part of it's uh, just the ways that different users' behavior can affect the behavior of others, you know, and some of it is, you know, how we decide to design our wallets and our transaction protocols. Our goal is to continue to make them better. All right. Thank you, Sarang, for joining us today. Thank you to the viewer, you, for watching another episode of Breaking Monero. Take care.